Hello and good morning. And this video is about the 27th October notification of the MCA mandating private companies to necessarily dematerialize the securities. Now, if somebody was to say that this has taken companies by surprise, I wouldn't say it's entirely correct uh, because uh, there were indications for a long time now. It was also part of the CLC working group report. Uh, that eventually shareholding of private companies also will be dematerialized. And probably also uh, one would understand that as a matter of um, past development on this on this front, uh, the shareholdings of listed companies were always dematerialized. The shareholdings in case of uh, unlisted public companies by virtue of adding uh, section 29 by 1 and pursuant to that, the power under rule 9A, uh, the securities in case of listed companies, unlisted public companies were anyway required to be um, required to be dematerialized. Now, the unlisted public companies came under this requirement of mandatory dematerialization sometime in late 2018 by addition of rule 9A. And I did say that this connects with Section 29 by one of the Companies Act, which requires companies to necessarily facilitate or ensure DMAT of the securities. But private companies were so far exempted from Rule 9A. And now the MC has added a Rule 9B, which is exactly applicable to private uh, companies. Uh, now, it's actually talking about dematerialization of all securities. So not just shares, but even if the private company in question has debentures, or others, other securities for that matter, those also require dematerialization. But this rule 9B is applicable to all private companies were very, very important exclusion. Small companies are exempt. As of now, small companies, one could probably say, Bakre ki maa kab tak but as of now, the Bakre ki maa is still out of the purview of um, uh, the mandatory dematerialized provision, provision. And therefore, in case of small companies, Small companies are those companies which anyway are private companies and they satisfy two conditions. Number one, the paid up capital is rupees within rupees 4 crores and the turnover is within rupees 40 crores. So a whole lot of service sector companies or holding companies will may actually be excluded from the mandatory dematting requirement by virtue of being small companies. When do we test the company as a small company or not? This is based on the reported financial statements. So as on 31st March 2023, the company in question satisfies two conditions. Namely, its paid up capital is within rupees 4 crores and the turnover is within rupees 40 crores. In that case, the company is a small company and a small company as of now, when I say as of now, I'm saying this may actually be uh, slated for extension in future. But as of now, small companies have been taken out of this mandatory dematting requirement. Also, government companies have also been excluded. There's a specific exclusion in case of government companies as well. So government companies, small companies apart, all other private companies are mandatorily required to ensure that they facilitate and when it comes to certain corporate actions, they actually mandate their shareholders to get their existing securities dematerialized. Remember that there's no grandfathering here. This is applicable to existing securities as well. Uh, I'll talk about when does an existing shareholder have to mandatorily get the shareholding uh, dematerialized. We'll talk about that as we proceed. So number one, this is applicable to, once again, all private unlisted companies to the ex with the exclusion of small companies and government companies. Now, the timeline is still a little spacious. I remember that when the requirement similarly came by virtue of Rule 9A in September 2018, the timeline was given only one month. There was a huge afra tafri then, but there was a very, very narrow timeline. But this time, luckily, substantial timeline, namely 18 months from the end of 31st March 2023. That would mean by 30th September 2020. So still a lot of time. 30th September 2024 is the timeline when private companies have to do the necessary arrangements to ensure that they have created facilitation for their shareholders to get their who does the dematting? It's not for the company to get the securities dematted. But the company, if it comes with further offer, it will have to offer securities in demat format. But 
Dematting has to be done by existing holders. And the company is actually facilitating the process by getting into a custodial agreement with the DP participant. So the company will do all of that by 30th September 2024. Remember once again, September 30th, 2024, if you talk about timeline from now, we are towards the end of October. So we have little less than one year, almost like 11 months still to ensure that we are ready to comply with this requirement. So the hard timeline for triggering the applicability of this statute of this provision is 30th September 2024. Now, what exactly does the requirement actually say? The requirement says when it comes to holdings by the directors, promoters, KMPs of the company. Remember, when you talk about a private company, most of the holdings are with directors and promoters. Promoter is a word which may or may not be identified as such because many companies don't actually identify a promoter by virtue of their annual return. In case of Listed companies promoter are promoters are identified in the public filings, stock exchange filings. But in case of private companies, identification of promoters may be done by annual return, but may not be done. However, if you go by statutory definition, people are holding control of the company are promoters. And obviously, in case of private companies, those who are managing the company are typically those who are holding control of the company. So I believe the word promoter will have a wide coverage to include largely the entire shareholding of a private company. However, the mandatory requirement is within September, that is on and from September 2024, you've done necessary arrangements so that the holdings of directors, promoters and KMPs is dematerialized by that date. Remember, I'm not saying from September to 24, you will start dematerializing. When it comes to holdings of directors, promoters and KMPs, you would have taken necessary actions by September 30th, 2024, so that the holdings of these people are already dematerialized. Further issue of securities, on and from that date, that is, from September 30th, 2024, any further issue of securities by companies will only be in DMAT form. Even if the company for that matter is coming with debenture issue, it will have to be mandatorily in DMAT form. So any securities, on and from the trigger date, that is September 30, 2024, will be in DMAT format. Further, when it comes to existing holders, if they come for transfer of the securities, as in when they come for transfers, the company will necessarily ensure that the transfers are done only in DMAT format. Further subscription, if the company wants to come up with further securities, further subscription also will be done by those holders in DMAT format. So what, what exactly is the is the phasing out or the phasing in of the requirement. Holdings of directors, promoters, and KMPs will necessarily have to be demated by September 30th, 2024. Any fresh issue of securities on and from that trigger date, September 30th, 2024, will be in DMAT format. And after the trigger date, that is September 30th, 2024, any transfers, any corporate actions, for example, the company wants to take a corporate, the company wants to do a further issue, the company wants to do a buyback. The company will need to ensure that it's in due compliance with the provision by September 30th, 2020. But September 30th is the date by which you need, need to ensure compliance. It's not the date from which you will start initiating the process. The process may be initiated before, so you have 11 months time to ensure dematting. But by September 30th, 2024, Holdings of all promoters, KMPs, etc. will be dematerialized. Any further issue of securities on and after that date will be in DMAT format. And transfers of securities on and from that date will also need to be in DMAT format. Thereafter, there is a half yearly filing requirement. A certain form called PASIX. PASIX is already applicable in case of unlisted public companies. It's a half yearly form. So within 60 days of the end of each half year, that is from September 30, 2024, 60 days, whatever that means, you'll need to ensure that you filed a PAS 6. Similarly, from 31st March 2024, 31st March 2025, I'm sorry, you'll need to ensure that you would have filed a PAS 6. What does the PAS 6 actually do? The PAS 6 does a reconciliation. How much of my holdings are already physical? How much of my holdings have already been dematerialized, etc. It's a kind of a tally sheet showing what is physical, what is demat what was required to be demetted, what has been demetted already. So it's a kind of tally of physical and demet uh, uh, position of the securities. That's a half yearly filing requirement.
And obviously a question comes, what if the company is not complying? What happens? If the company is not in compliance of this provision, the provision is connected with rule sec section 29. It would therefore amount to a breach of section 29. A breach of section 29, section 29 does not seem to have a specific penalty provision and therefore the general general penalty section in section 450 will be applicable. Remember that this section requires a penalty. It's not requiring a fine. Had it been a fine, it would have been a um, prosecution requirement. But the section relates to a penalty and the penalty is rupees 10,000 for a breach and rupees 1,000 per day of a continuing offense. As the obligation is cast upon the company, as well as the holders, I would assume the company as well as the shareholders, both will be liable to a penalty, which may extend to rupees 1,000 per day. Now, that might be substantial cost burden. Now, here comes certain questions. What about foreign shareholders? A whole lot of private companies in India are subsidies of foreign companies. Do the foreign shareholders also require the securities to be demetted? My straight answer to that would be yes, because there is no exclusion to a foreign holder. So even a foreign shareholder, to my mind, will require mandatory dematting. But a question still remains, what about wholly owned subsidiaries? If the company happens to be a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign holder, or let's say an Indian company, a wholly owned subsidiary, is the requirement of dematting applicable to wholly owned subsidiaries as well? Now, this question is actually a little confusing because in Rule 9A, there is a subrule 11 which exempts wholly on subsidies. And in Rule 9B, subrule 4 to 10 of Rule 9A have been imported or extended, but subrule 11 has not been extended. However, it seems quite illogical that something which is exempt in case of public unlisted companies would not be exempt in case of private companies. Private companies being a little less uh, public matter, it being let less uh, prone to regulation, it seems illogical that something which would have been exempted in case of public unlisted companies is not exempt in case of private companies. Therefore, while subrule 4 to 10 have been imported in 9B, but subrule 11 after all is nothing but a carve out from the previous subrules. Therefore, by by logical extension to my view, in my view, in case of wholly owned subsidies, the requirement should not be applicable. If the wholly owned subsidy happens to be wholly owned subsidy of a public company, in any case, it would be covered by Rule 9A because it would be deemed public company to which section uh, sub, sub, rule, uh, sub Rule 9 or Rule 9A would be applicable. However, one might take a contentious view on that. So as of now, the answer to this question, whether wholly owned subsidy would be covered or not, the answer still remains a question mark. How about companies with uh, without share capital, companies limited by guarantee, not having share capital? For example, clubs. A club may have 1,000 members. The members don't have share capital. They're still members of a company. Now, what is demetted is the shareholding. And if the company doesn't have shares, all that the company has is a guarantee. The question of demetting in case of companies not having share capital, companies limited by guarantee, not having share capital, the question does not arise at all. So in this case, my answer is very clear. You know, in case of companies, uh, companies not having share capital at all, the answer is clear. No, wholly on subsidies, I'm still lost. Uh, there is um, logical exemption, however, not clearly spelled out. Now, what is the larger implication of this provision? Now, let's first understand that this provision is actually forcing companies to dematerialize their entire share holding. And this is, once again, another strong measure which the present government has been taking to bring holdings in companies into the organized sector. And it's a matter of common knowledge that substantial extent of holdings in companies still continues to be in so-called Benami names, where the holders may be people without identif identity proofs or may simply be what you call Benami holders. So number one, it's a major stroke on the so-called menace of Benami holdings. All shareholdings in private companies, other than in case of small companies, will mandatorily have to move into organized mode with each of the holders getting their uh, DMAT accounts, putting their shareholdings in DMAT format. So number one, it's almost equivalent to a corporate uh, demonetization. Dematerialization might translate into demonetization because essentially, 
the entire holding will have to come into the organized sport. In terms of compliance burden, if we talk about the number of private companies in India, roughly about 14 lakh companies, as per data as of January 2023, roughly about 50,000 companies were small companies. But I think this number actually might increase quite, quite, quite a lot because after the increase in threshold limit of private com of our small companies to 4 crores and 40 crores respectively, to my mind, a whole lot of private companies will go under exempt list because of being a small company. So even if I assume that roughly 2 to 3 lakh companies will qualify as small companies, we're still talking about about 11 lakh companies mandatorily getting into DMAT requirement. Even if you take off these 11 companies, let's say on an average, the company has 5 shareholders. We're talking about roughly 50 lakh to 55 lakh shareholders mandatorily getting or opening DMAT accounts. Now, there are two costs. Number one, when the company moves for dematerialization, there may be multiple costs. Number one, there'll be cost of stamp duty because the physical shares have to be surrendered. The physical shares must be in duly stamped mode and therefore there might be a stamp duty implication. Um, I'm guessing that quite often stamp duty may not have been paid at the time of initial issuance. So while dematting, you need to ensure that there's a stamp duty on the shares. That's part one. The shares will be stamped. That's part one. Part two, the company will be paying some kind of an annual custodial charge because the company will have to uh, dematerialize this entire shareholding. There's a cost on the company. There's a cost on each shareholder as well because every shareholder who opens a DMAT account pays an annual maintenance charge to the maintenance charge to depository participant. So in terms of cost on the company, there are as many as three types of costs. Number one, initial stamp duty. Number two, a custodial charge. And then there is a half yearly pass six requirement. This pass six is not merely filing by the company. This will also have to be certified by a practicing professional. So go to a CS, go to a chartered accountant, get the form certified and you're doing it twice a year. So that twice a year, there's a past six filing requirement as well. That's talking about the cost of the companies and that apart cost on each holder as well. Besides, of course, ensuring that each holder has a valid identif identification proof, has a valid uh, pen number or other entity proof. So this is a significant move uh, affecting all the private companies in the country. Uh, well, it's um, time for people to get ready to comply with this. We will be discussing this requirement further. We'll be developing uh, FAQs on this requirement and probably look forward to interacting with you further with maybe further workshop on this topic. In the meantime, let's keep reading for this uh, major requirement. So thank you very much uh, for listening to this video and stay tuned for the other two requirements of the MC on the same date. There's a requirement on uh, having a designated person in addition to an SBO, that's part one. And part two, there is some requirement which has come actually as a part of this very rule, the one that you're discussing just now about share warrants. We'd like to discuss elaborately on what exactly the share warrant referred to. What is the uh, MC objection in issuance of share warrants? Are share warrants now illegal? we like to discuss each of these in these two forthcoming videos I'm talking about. Number one about share warrants and number two about a designated person in addition to a significant beneficial owner. So stay tuned and thank you very much for watching this video.